Okay. I'll get there. I'll get there. I just wanted to make sure. All right. We're ready. We're <laughs> Good morning, everybody. We have a full room today. And for those online, I apologize for a little bit of chaos. We're excited, obviously. Um, so today is Wednesday, April 13th. And we are here for the Marion County Board of Commissioners meeting in the Senator Hearing Room at 555 Court Street, Northeast in Salem. Would you all please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You want to share that? <laughs> All right, so we don't, do we, we don't have public comment, I'm looking at Brenda, we do have one, okay. So I will wait, and actually we're just going to bring you right around over here. Oh, this is the hotline. <laughs> yeah, you're on the spotlight now. Yes, please. And is it Sheila Acosta? Yes, perfect. Okay, good morning. Good morning, and thank you. That was very heartwarming. I thought that was gone out of America. <laughs> it is not gone out of America, not in Marion County. Anyway. Oh, very powerful. Thank you. Thank you. If you would, please just introduce yourself and your um, residence. You don't need to state your full address if you don't want to, but your city that you live in. Oh, certainly. Uh, my name is Sheila Costa. I've been a nurse for over 30 years. I retired and started my own business after a lot of our trauma events and crimes. I'm a survivor, and I'm here today to ask, for, well, I live in Turner, Oregon. When I was one year old, we came to Oregon. And I retired there in Turner, <laughs> where I first started. And I'm not a public speaker, so pardon me if I stutter. <laughs> We're just regular people. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, there's been a lot of crimes committed against me and my husband. We're both disabled. And we've been trying to seek help through certain agencies and avenues and speaking with Marion County Police, State Police, Salem Police. And we're not really getting anywhere because um, over time, with false accusations, crimes, um, false imprisonments. I mean, I have a list. It's unbelievable. It's like a horrible movie. But we survived. And now we have a business, helping people with disabilities. And we're hoping to get grants and funding to remodel everything that's been destroyed in our lives. But what I'm here today to ask is, how do I go about having Marion County help me with all these crimes to investigate, I have beyond beautiful evidence that no one's looked at. Videos, text messages, messengers, handwritten letters of how they're gonna frame me, and then they do it. I've been jailed, beaten, accused, service dogs stolen, house destroyed three times, including ripping out walls, electricity, and plumbing. I've had to make all, make all those repairs myself since they have forged my power of attorney and stolen everything from us, time and time again. It's called gaslighting. Has anyone ever heard of that? It sounds unreal, and I know it sounds crazy. We've all heard about it. We've all heard about horrible crimes. I worked at the prison system as a contract nurse for Oregon State. I know what kind of people are in there. I never imagined that it would turn out to be my family. And so, it's my duty to put them behind bars so no one else has to go through what I did. So how do I get help? So uh, my staff person's in the audience and, and he'll follow you out and he'll get your phone number and I'll follow up with you. Okay, because I've taken this up the chain of command. I started with the officers who was given false information. I have everything on video. I don't know how in the world I figured out how to download videos and uh, up things to the cloud and download evidence. Because when they stole my phone, they stole everything. I just downloaded it again and again and again. Little me who doesn't know anything. I have autism. I'm very disabled, but I never let it stop me ever. I've gone to the commissioner, I've gone to the commander, I've gone to the lieutenant. I've gone to um, Joe Cast himself. And I'm told all these things are civil. They're not civil. They're all connected. And when I found out how they were connected, to my horror, wow, 
Lieutenant Bergman was going to assign me a special duty officer to help me investigate this, but due to lies and uh, miscommunication on my behalf, because I didn't know how to communicate, I was suffering PTSD, and all the crimes committed had shut me down, and I was very disabled to where I couldn't walk, talk, take care of myself, and I was homeless living in my car. How shameful was that? I'm a business owner now, and I'm rebuilding my home, and I'm going to help other people like me. That is an honor. Thank you, Sheila, for coming today and sharing your story. Certainly. And whom do I get the number from? Matt, in that yellowish shirt. Hey, Matt, good to meet you. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you. We're not laughing at you. We're laughing at him. You're very welcome here. Yes, thank you. Okay, so now we're going to move on to our first presentation of the day. Ma Madam Chair, yeah. be before we do that, and Sheila's from Turner, and um, longtime city manager from Turner, um, David passed away yesterday. Oh my and, gosh. Um, God rest his soul. And uh, well, I guess it was it was on the seventh of April. Uh, was what's the date? Today. Yeah, so it was last week, and, and she just reminded me of that, and um, just keeping his family and, and uh, the city in, in uh, our prayers. Uh, he did such a fantastic job there. Uh, I remember, I think he came, uh, I got appointed to the, um, the house in 2005, and he was there just before I got there, and he served Turner in our community for a very long time, and so I just wanted to honor him this morning and say just uh, we, we we're our prayers and our thoughts are with his family and with the city of Turner when she mentioned Turner I thought oh yeah I forgot about that Thank you, Commissioner. yeah if we could maybe we could take a moment of silence I'd, I'd love to yeah Bethel. For the record, Chris Epley, I'm the Community Development Division Director for Marion County. I work up in the board's office. And welcome to status report number 16 for the wildfire recovery. So we are about 19 months out after the fire, and there's a lot going on up in the canyon. So uh, just very quickly to go through the initial statistics, you can see based on the building permits issued, uh, and once again, these are building permits issued, not necessarily building permits executed. So there's a lag between when something is issued and when it's completed. Um, but in Mill City, they have about 40% of the permits representing the properties damaged by the fire have been issued. Uh, Gates is at 53%, Detroit at 34%, which lags behind the others, but a, a much greater percentage of Detroit was damaged than the other communities uh, up there and unincorporated Marion County is at around 58% um, of, uh, of uh, I'm sorry, Marion County and Lynn County at about 58% uh, of the building permits issued toward recovery. Septic permits are a leading indicator, so people will apply for a septic permit uh, potentially before they apply for a building permit. Um, so this kind of shows you in advance what people are thinking about doing with their properties. And you can see that um, as a total, about 62% um, of those damaged properties in Marion Lynn counties have at least applied for a septic permit, which means that they're thinking about doing something with their property, whether rebuilding it, uh, using it for recreation, et cetera. But activity is, is coming back up into the canyon. So the next two slides are, I'm st and I'm still working on this. These next two slides are sort of a work in progress, but I'm trying to get at telling the story of evaluation. So this is the difference between what was there versus what is building back in terms of how assessed valuations are, are coming back uh, in the county. So the blue, in, is, so this particular slide only shows those permits that have been completed. So those homes, those businesses, those structures 
where a certificate, certificate of occupancy has been issued and uh, their, uh, th that construction is complete. Um, although, it doesn't necessarily show you what the current valuation is because assess assessments only occur certain times of year. So some of these values, especially in Detroit, may be on structures that were assessed before they were completed, so it doesn't reflect the total value that will be as they become assessed again the next time. Um, but you can see in unincorporated Marion County, for instance, based on the number of permits, or based on those permits that have been completed, uh, we are at about two million above what the evaluation was on those same permits prior to the fire. So what is being built back is, is significantly higher than what was there prior to the fire. And you can see in terms of what was destroyed, um, the gray bar shows the evaluations directly after the fire. So there was a lot lost and a lot has come back. And so this particular is sort of the recovery totals for assessed valuation. And I want to point you once again to unincorporated Marion County. Um, Marion County stands at about 60% of all permits having been issued for, uh, on properties that were damaged. And yet the valuations are up closer to 80%. And so what is being built back is, uh, is going to be a significant increase uh, in assessed valuation for the entire county uh, and, and also for those communities. So that is actually a sign of hope for those communities because they'll be able to use that revenue and those assessed valuations uh, to build better lives for their citizens. And then this is just something I want to show you. Uh, uh, I've been working with uh, Brandon Reich and Chris Trussell uh, in planning and building and also IT to develop an interactive map that shows you the status of all permits that have been issued, septic, residential, commercial, et cetera, whether they've been applied for, whether they've been completed, all of those things, and then you can filter the kind of information you want to see, and you can scroll through the county. And this is ready to go live and ready to go on the public-facing side of the, the county site, but I want to show it to you first so that you could see it before we push it out live. But anybody uh, will be able to get on the community development uh, website and then scroll through the county and find what's happening in their communities and what's built what's building back and what isn't county-led projects so and this doesn't include all of them just sort of the ones I'm, I'm able to uh, report on at this point but in terms of housing uh, in gates the Evans Haven project uh, the good news is that 16 tiny homes have been ordered and are being constructed and it's looking like they will be placed toward the end of August and so we're actually going to finally have units for people to move back up into the canyon uh, while they complete uh, the reconstruction of their primary or secondary homes up there. So North Sanium Park, uh, the, the IGA uh, intergovernmental agreement between the state and the county is complete so the county is now in control of that property the environmental assessment has begun. Tribal consult on the property is, is completed. Archaeological consult, consult is uh, set to begin later at the end of this month. In terms of the septic repair and replacement, this is really one of the biggest issues for reconstruction, especially in Detroit and in un unincorporated uh, Marion County, is septic systems are expensive. And in some uh, cases, the property available to place them on uh, creates a constraint and makes it difficult to rebuild. So we have a number of different programs that are being worked on. Uh, Public Works is developing an RFP right now, request for proposals to design and construct a downtown septic system for Detroit, which will allow the downtown area to come back. Uh, that's, that's actually a very, very difficult situation for those businesses to rebuild right now, just based on the age and uh, uh, damage associated with those septic systems and the property available to rebuild them on. Uh, we're also working on a residential septic repair and replacement program, and then the state has a bunch of money available through competitive grants um, uh, through the uh, Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, the, and, and that is a statewide program. It's not, it's not specifically focused on the county, um, but there are there are a number of different pots of funding available for folks. Uh, also, um, 
there's a fire hardening grant that we're ready to roll out. It's about $1.5 million available. It will be administered through the building department. I think they're actually gonna talk to you today about that particular topic or very soon because that program is ready to roll out to citizens. So the last time I was here, you asked me, uh, Commissioner Bethel specifically, to go take a look at the North Fork area. And I did that. Um, and though there was a lot happening up in the canyon and a lot of great things to talk about, there's also still a lot of devastation in certain parts uh, where the fire uh, took place. And I wanted to show you that, uh, some of that today. Uh, I also wanted to point out the Sheriff's Department team that works in the canyon. You have Sergeant Matt Wilkinson, Deputy uh, Derek R uh, Ramsayer, Tom Lyons and Garrett Olson. Uh, these are the gentlemen that are up working in some of the most remote parts of the county every single day, making connections with citizens and providing law and order, and they do a great job. And they were also, uh, many of them or all of them, uh, highly responsible for saving a lot of people's lives during the fire. And um, this is just a great team. And I, I, I was honored to go on a tour, Deputy Olson took me on that tour and took me everywhere. There's the route we took, and I only list that to show you that we went everywhere up in, <laughs> north, uh, up in the North Fork area, all the way up to past Shady Cove Campground to Jawbone Flats, uh, which is kind of where the road ends. And, and um, anyway, it was, it, was, it was great to see all of it. And this is what you can still see uh, today, and I'll point some of these things out. You still have a lot of roads that are closed with fallen trees, et cetera. You can see the state of some of the forested areas up in the North Fork that are just sort of like Gotham City. They're charcoal. It's going to be a very long time before the, the, the foliage comes back in those areas. Um, the two bottom left pictures I wanted to show you because I found them interesting. This is up at Jawbone Flats, and in the farthest left picture is a suburban that is completely burned out. And the fire got so hot that if you go up, you can see the aluminum from the block melted and pouring out on the ground. And it's now solidified. Just in back of it is this little ticket booth or whatever that is. Um, and it was completely untouched by the fire. So I don't know how that happens. It's just a little wooden painted structure. And it, it suffered absolutely no damage whatsoever, uh, even though it was hot enough to melt that vehicle. These are some other pictures, but you can just see sort of the level of devastation that occurred in that area. The fire was very hot. My understanding is that the winds were blowing uh, over the peaks um, at close to 110 miles an hour at the peak of the fire. And so it was, it was pretty phenomenal. But this is what you're seeing. People are building back up in that area. Uh, they're being creative. So top left picture, you can see that one of the property owners actually took all of the trees, or a lot of the trees that had been burned, had them milled and is rebuilding his house with them. So to sort of honor his, uh, his previous property. So that's, that's really great. These are just some other pictures of houses that are coming back. And actually, the North Fork area is doing really well in terms of the amount of reconstruction that is occurring. So if you go up in that area, you can see pictures like this all over the place of people rebuilding um, primary residences, moving back, reestablishing a presence up in that area. Okay, so the long-term recovery group and the Salem Service Integration Team, and I always like to reach out to these folks because they're doing a lot of hard work actually connecting with individuals, um, working with families, trying to get them reestablished. Um, the SIT, the Service Integration Team, currently has 289 homeowners and renters that they're uh, in active case management with, 32 are on a waiting list. And at the same time, there are still people that they have never seen before contacting them for help. Uh, and that'll probably happen for quite a while. Um, as a specific project that is becoming available through OHCS, Oregon Housing and Community Service Department, uh, there is a new grant program that they're working, which will be a zero down, zero interest, 10-year forgivable loan uh, to help people replace manufactured homes that they lost in the fire. So that's going to be a really great asset for folks. So if they, um, I'm directing people to that site that will not be managed through the county, it'll be managed through OHCS. But it's going to be a really great help for folks who lost um, their, their manufactured home. Uh, 
Uh, this past month, the LTRG, the Long-Term Recovery Group, has worked with Good360, which is a program under the United Way to coordinate survivor shopping trips and visits to Salem. So they're basically taking people, bringing them into town, shopping with them to get home goods to help replace what they lost in the fire. And so that is a great program. Um, I will say that Marion County, specifically uh, Matt Lawyer in the creamsicle colored shirt back there, <laughs> um, <laughs> worked with uh, Arches and the SIT to ensure that all the residents of the Mill City RV Park on Highway 22 have plans um, and know what they're going to do once that park goes back into private operation, which is going to happen very soon. Um, the LTRG has had a lot of large donations of doors and housing equipment. Um, so they, they, have, they have things for people who are rebuilding. Um, they also received and planted over 48,000 trees in an effort to try to reforest uh, some of the areas up in the county, include some of the county parks. So the LTRG is doing really great work. This is a picture of uh, the members that work on the, the uh, Sanium integration team, the service integration team. And they, as a little bit of good news, received the Community Impact Award from the State and Sublimity Chamber of Commerce, which is an annual award. And it recognizes individuals, businesses, organizations whose contributions have made a positive, indelible, and lasting impact on the community. So this is a great honor for them. They're doing great work. The LTRG has been working to build sheds for folks, and this is a great uh, project. There's a lot of people who are trying to rebuild need places to store tools and equipment or parts of their lives while they reclaim uh, their, their dwellings. So the initial hope was that they would be able to build 100 sheds. They're at 68 to date. But May 26th is going to be their last day of construction. And they're looking for volunteers. So if you can swing a hammer, even if you can't, but they prefer if you can, <laughs> um, go to the LTRG's website. And there is a place where you can register for that build and help them build sheds for folks. May 26th. This is a report very quickly on uh, the uh, Saniam Wildfire Relief Fund, their initial goal was to raise $5 million to directly help uh, victims of the fire. They, to date, have raised $4.2 million, a little bit over, and that's a breakdown uh, of sort of where those, uh, where those funds are going. And these are basically, this money is going directly to wildfire survivors to help meet their needs. And so there are a lot of great efforts occurring up in the canyon. There's still a lot of work to do. Um, but it's an honor to be a part of it, and I'll answer any questions. Any questions? No, that was very comprehensive. Great report. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Um, but the only thing that uh, I think the uh, community center in Detroit's getting really close. Do we know what the I do. time I see Nick, like he, he's over there, like shaking his head. Last time I went by there, they were serving food and put, putting in landscaping and stuff. Oh well. <laughs> I can tell you. I can tell you. One of the projects that I personally am working on is developing a uh, a transference of ownership agreement and then a lease back agreement between the city of Detroit and the Detroit Lake Foundation. So they're getting close enough that they want me to start working on those documents so that they can actually finalize who's going to own what and who's going to operate what at the end of it. But they're hoping, I think, um, to be ready to occupy that building in May. So it is, is very, beautiful. it is very close. So, and they have to occupy it in May because the city of Detroit's temporary offices in Staten are no longer available to them starting the 1st of June. So it has to happen very quickly here. Great. That's one of my projects. Anything else? <clears throat> Thank you all Thank very you, much. Chris. All right, now we're gonna move on to our next presentation. And looks like Tamara Getz from Community Services, Eric Anderson from Sedport, and Nick Harville from Sedport are gonna join us. They give us a street Strategic Economic Development Corporation, or said for, of the Midwam Valley Quarterly Report. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Tamara Getch, uh, Director for Community Services. Excited to be here with you today to introduce our friends from SEDCOR. I'll let them introduce themselves, but let me just tell uh, our audience how they're coming in and why they are connected with our economic development program. 
So Marion County receives a portion of Oregon Video Lottery dollars uh, from the state of Oregon and a portion of these dollars uh, are allocated out to key partners to help us advance our economic development agenda in Marion County. Um, one of those key partners uh, is SEDCOR. We have a contract, an uh, existing contract with them for five years. It started in 2018 and is set to expire in June of 23. However, in that contract, uh, they help us in um, expanding our business retention and expansion efforts and help us to um, work through that, um, that interest throughout Marion County to bring businesses, expand, um, and retain um, throughout their efforts through SEDCOR and other partnerships. So it's with my um, excitement and a pleasure to introduce our uh, two presenters today from SEDCOR. Eric and... Oh, looks like we have a little technical difficulties here. <laughs> and Nick. Eric, you want to get started and I'll yeah. manage our... Thank you, Tamara. Mm -hmm. uh, good morning, Eric Anderson with SEDCOR. Um, thank you for having us here. Um, I think you're all fam pretty familiar with our organization, but, uh, you know, I put our sort of official um, uh, mission statement on here as, as far as leveraging public and private partnerships to successfully grow, retain, attract high value jobs and capital investments. But I think you're probably more familiar with our um, more informal uh, motto, which is we know a guy or we know a gal. <laughs> and um, I think as Tamara pointed out, the work that we do around business recruitment and uh, um, retention and expansion particularly is uh, really predicated on the fact that we have relationships with the, the business community, community leaders, and uh, uh, generally uh, we know a guy when somebody calls us up and asks for some help. Just a quick um, you know, review of kind of economic development in general, and this is our 40th year, as I think you all know also, that we've been around for 40 years, so we've hit midlife crisis mode. Um, but we're busier than ever, so it is, uh, it is good for us uh, to be able to share um, how we've been expanding the last couple of years. Um, generally, the three pillars of economic development are, are um, business retention and expansion is kind of the key. Um, that's where the jobs are. That's where the um, investment comes from. The businesses are already here in the community. Um, recruitment gets the attention. You know, one business recruitment gets headlines, and and uh, um, and we do um, work very closely with businesses to uh, you know attract that investment into the region. Um, in the last couple of years, we've added entrepreneurism as that th third pillar. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that later around the work that we're doing with our venture catalyst and the, um, uh, our Mid-Valley um, entrepreneurial ecosystem development. Um, and the f we've added actually a fourth pillar in the last few years to really reflect the work that we do, and that's community development. And that's maybe not necessarily our main you know, thrust of our work, but as we're out there talking to communities, talking to businesses, um, we've started to identify um, opportunities for certainly the long-term work that Nick and others have done around CTE uh, training uh, for our workforce and making that connectivity with the school systems. Also, we've been getting involved with uh, you know, worker or employer-based daycare, um, transportation issues, and um, we, we convene those meetings and introduce the folks to, to uh, parties that can help them, um, but that is a role that we play uh, and uh, um, spend a significant amount of time on. And I think there's generally also the other duties as required that comes up quite a bit, and whether it's been the last couple of years of different COVID uh, economic uh, recovery or PPE manufacturing locally and helping to identify resources uh, and opportunities to sell to the state for PPE. Um, but really a lot of the work that we've been doing, and, and Nick has uh, done a phenomenal job, is around wildfire recovery. So I'll, I'll ask Nick to uh, talk to that. Good morning, Commissioners from the Carvel and Silverton. Um, thanks, Chris, for the great report for the SID and the LTRG. <clears throat> I happen to sit on the board of directors of the LTRG, the Santa Ham Canyon Long-Term Recovery Group. Um, economic development means different things, and it kind of depends on what it means to someone, um, what community they live in. 
Um, Detroit is not the same as Donald, obviously, um, because every community has its own opportunities, challenges, and its own priorities. Um, Commissioner Cameron was wondering about the community center. I think you've probably seen the gymnasium. Um, there's some people that want to play basketball on that floor pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's Walter in great Martin. shape. Uh, Rich Duncan has done a fantastic job, along with uh, about 93 other companies who have donated their time and effort and materials and people to make this a reality. Uh, I was up there a couple weeks ago and DeSantis Landscaping was putting in on all the underground water system. And Dean said on his way up there, the company that supplies all the pipe and, and fixtures donated all that material just that morning. And Dean brought his own lunch wagon with him too. Um, Kenny was the chef. Um, I didn't stick around to eat, but I'm sure it was good. Um, the sheds, um, that all started with Troy Goldstrom, the minister at Mahama Community Church. He came to me about 18, 17, whatever months ago and said, hey, we want to build some sheds. <clears throat> about 390 of them. It's like, oh, okay. Um, 10 by 10 sheds, nothing fancy. So I put the call out and over 50 companies that were core members and non-members came together and we came up with enough to build 50 and most of those were built right at Mahama Church. Um, they now have facilities thanks to Marv Shetler, Blazer Industries, um, Marv's building in Staten off of Wilco Road. Um, they're getting to use that so everything's inside all the templates and everything are moved down there. Um, thanks to uh, Associated General Contractors of Oregon, uh, there was a news article over the weekend that they had done all this, and I'm sure that was a mistake. Um, but AGC has been a partner. The uh, NAWIC, Women in Construction, the Salem chapter has been an, a great advocate of this program and continues to try and build sheds to supply people storage, so, uh, which is very limited. Um, okay, so that's the update on that. Thanks, Nick. Um, as I mentioned, you know, the business retention expansion is the heart of our work. Nick is our business retention expansion manager for Marion County. And uh, we have a few pictures here just to kind of give an example of the types of businesses that we've been working with. Um, I'm sure you all know Ferris Woods. They, their uh, 100th year celebration is this year. They're rebranding themselves. It's not Ferris Slumber anymore. It's Ferris Woods. Um, and they have been a, an intricate part of the new development at the Portland Airport. I think it's pretty fantastic. Um, Mass Supply, as it's now called, is being used in a lot of applications. Schmeckata's new Ag Center um, at the campus has a lot of Mass Supply in it, in the ceiling, in the desks, in the counters. Um, Another picture on the left there is Yamasa, a company here in Salem. They make soy sauce, and one of the main ingredients to the soy sauce is hard wheat. Um, for years, they have bought wheat through brokers, mainly in Canada. And a few years ago, um, they grew some wheat in Yamhill County with the Rudin Claws. It was successful. Everybody said we couldn't grow the wheat, we couldn't grow the protein level, and that's one of the keys. Um, but we did, and it had exceeded the protein levels. This is the third year that Rudin Claws will be growing wheat. And so we recently had a meeting with Yamasa 
and some growers from around the valley at Yamasa. And uh, the reception by the growers to grow wheat for them in the future has been kind of overwhelming. Uh, it included uh, Proud and Co-op, Valley Ag, Marion Ag, um, Marion Ag, um, Tom Wimmer said he's met with some of the growers and he has several growers that want to grow wheat. So it would be locally grown wheat used to make soy sauce here in Salem. Um, the other one on the right hand corner is a meat processor. If <laughs> when I first went out there, um, there was a little like eight and a half by 11 sign um, <laughs> hanging on the, on the fence. If you didn't know where they were, you would have never found them. They spent 17, I think 17 million dollars in an expansion here in Marion County. Um, most of it is exported back out of the country. Um, some of it is, is here, it's sold in California, um, but most of it is exported back out of the country. And in the center with the yellow, you'll see uh, a little stainless steel sign that says DK Fab. Um, that is a hop processing um, that it was put in by Sodbuster to stay the art. And DK Fab did most of it. Um, you provided DK Fab with um, a tax exemption for their new shop. Uh, I think it's like six to seven million dollar expansion outside of Jervis. Uh, they were delayed because of a fire at their facility in Washington. But now they're moving full steam ahead. <clears throat> um, another thing about how this all kind of goes around, comes around. DK Fab did a lot of work for the Iverson family um, with their CBD processing. The other day, um, here recently, the president of the American Farm Bureau, um, <laughs> I love this, Zippy Duvall, um, <laughs> is the gentleman's name, um, toured their CBD processing facility in Hubbard. It's all state of the art. It's an amazing place to visit. I would love to take the commissioners up there to see this facility. In, in Hubbard, um, and the Iversons have done a fantastic job. So that's kind of how things come around. When you look back at the at the community center in um, Donald, uh, Pratham Co-op isn't a said core member, but we have a relationship. And when Rich said we needed an LP tank for the uh, backup generator, I called Troy. Kinsey, who's president of Bradham Co-op. Um, and Troy donated a LP tank and the first two fills to the community center. So I think it says a lot for the county. One thing too with that Shinsege um, uh, mention, um, we're hopefully trying to plan a, some sort of event for them as a kind of a kickoff for their uh, expansion. And we were talking to them about, you know, snacks, coffee came up, and uh, they kind of talked amongst themselves a little bit. And we we're trying to encourage them to, you know, locally owned roaster maybe, and they all decided Starbucks, and then said, well, you know, that's fine. Um, their parent company actually owns Starbucks Korea, um, mm -hmm. so you know, sometimes we just don't know who we have in the community. Um, they've actually, they're also connected. Their parent um, owns what is now called E-Mart in Korea, um, which was formerly Walmart Korea. So when we start these relationships with a business like that, we never know where that could go, and there may be other opportunities for other businesses to get into those stores uh, through export as well. So it's that connectivity. Uh, it's always good to ask questions because you just never know where uh, simple questions, where do you want the coffee to come from, can uh, educate you quite a bit on where there might be opportunities. I wanted to talk a little bit about recruitment. Um, a couple projects that 
Um, we're probably most familiar with this uh, work that we've been doing around the Mill Creek Corporate Center over the years. Um, I'm happy to say, although I think there's a little bit of asterisk to this, most of the sites at Mill Creek now are largely um, accounted for with the, either projects or private developers that are courting projects. We have um, two that are, I think, getting pretty close to being announced, one in particular on May 3rd. Um, we're hoping to make an announcement with the, co with the company here that will be going into the Skinnell Logistics Center um, site at Mill Creek. It's uh, I think about $140 million investment. So it's a uh, you know, good investment into the community. We've already talked to um, about Enterprise Zone for them. Um, but the kind of asterisk to this is industrial land is becoming really tight. I put on there an example uh, you'll see later of uh, industrial land in Staten. That's we've had on our um, uh, inventory for 20 years. and. Uh, now there's activity on that. Um, so you know we're going to be looking for where those next uh, projects can go in the long term. Um, I put a copy. It was a project that we've been working on. You know, they all have, as you know, code names. Um, but Project Alfred um, is a uh, hydroponic um, greenhouse project. And you know they're looking nationally. It's an East Coast company that does uh, um, national retail. Um, as, a, as a market and you know for us it's that's the kind of thing we love to see people take an interest in this region because it really does get back to the roots of the area you know we, we, we grow things here and uh, and also the technology aspects of that are pretty exciting um, one that has come up in the last 24 hours that I guess we're able to talk about yeah. I mean let me have uh, Nick address that a little bit uh, in his backyard in Silverton um, it's an honor to say that Tillamon County Smokers will be moving in, is moving into the Bruce Pack property mm -hmm. in Silverton and creating initially about 50 jobs. Um, <clears throat> they have spent the last couple weeks <clears throat> refinishing all the floors in the building and some of their equipment has showed up. And so it's sitting outside, uh, large cranes, we're taking out some of the uh, refrigeration tanks that Bruce Back needed or used to use for their IQF. Um, so that caused a little interest around town. It's the main street. It's right across the street from Ross Grocery Store. I mean, what the heck. Um, so Our Town Press published a story yesterday about what was going on. Um, in Silverton with Bruce Pack. So now the cat's out of the bag. Um, and it's communities like Silverton that I think uh, I'd like to refer back to when I started uh, 15 years and eight months ago with SEDCOR. Um, about two years after I got there, Champion closed down in, in Silverton, which cost about 200 jobs. The building sat empty for a couple of years. And then we were instrumental in recruiting Forest River cargo trailers to come in there and create about that many jobs back in. Um, and they're still operating. They purchased the property. Um, in a community like Silverton, um, three companies have moved out. And we've helped recruit three companies back in Silverton. Uh, recently, Pioneer Truck Well moved into a facility out in the industrial park. Um, they maintain their property here in Salem as a repair facility. The 10,000 square foot building in Turner is for sale. Um, but they're building dump boxes, dump truck boxes in Silverton now and uh, have hired a few people. So. When we get our job right, communities prosper. Jobs are created. Tax base is maintained. So we try to get it right. And one last uh, kind of a combination between recruitment and, and retention expansion, I guess. Um, the the, the mm -hmm. from, meadow foam photos are not necessarily a coincidence here because uh, one of the other projects that we're excited about in the area is uh, Oregon Metafoam growers um, have traditionally, uh, <coughs> that 
co-op is largely Willamette Valley uh, growers from this area. I think there's one from uh, South Valley. And uh, they've traditionally done all of their processing in California, you know, contract processing, California and Arizona. They've brought that in-house into the, into the region um, under the company uh, Natural Plant Products. They're out at Mill Creek in a pack trust building, but they will be uh, making their oil that's used in makeup, um, mostly exported, you know, make makeup and cosmetics industries. But another case of where uh, what we're growing locally is going to be processed here now instead of Arizona or California. And uh, along with that comes investment and jobs. I mentioned we'd uh, added entrepreneurship to our kind of menu about three years ago, I believe. And um, a lot of this is just geared towards first identifying who has an active interest in this. And pretty much everybody does. Every one of the communities that we work with in the three counties has an interest in entrepreneurial development. Um, we put together Launch Mid Valley as an opportunity just to connect on um, that subject and be sure that there are resources that are available around the region. Um, part of that led to the hiring of a venture catalyst. I think uh, a lot of you know Mike White. Um, he works with businesses that are uh, scalable, um, needing investment um, of all sorts. And um, part of that, his work led to uh, our first um, Mid Valley um, Angel Fund. Uh, where local folks actually uh, contributed as, as much as $5,000 shares, and uh, we were able to pull together about $55,000 in a small investment pool and fund three businesses um, to do some expansions. And uh, we're working on the second round of that as we as we move into the into the new year. Um, and then, kind of hot off the presses, we were asked to apply. Um, for, as a consortium with the uh, Latino Business Alliance, uh, Advanced Economic Solutions, uh, Chemeketa Community College Small Business Development Center, and the Council of Governments for a technical assistance grant that's uh, providing uh, culturally and linguistically appropriate entrepreneurial uh, training and support. Um, and part of that is uh, leading to uh, the um, formation of a revolving loan fund for um, Latino, the Latino Business Alliance, and we're going to be coordinating that as part of this process. So that's on the horizon. We just got our contract from Business Oregon yesterday to, uh, to sign off on that. And one of the things that we're always talking about because we have such a varied, um, uh, you know, such a variety of activities that we work on is that the work that we do is industry driven. We learn what some of the issues and opportunities are out there as we talk with businesses and uh, uh, we adapt, um, we learn, we adapt, we ask people how to, uh, how to address some of those issues that we may not be familiar with. Um, and that feeds into what we do as kind of our work plan. Um, supply chain development, we've already talked a, a little bit about that, but when you talk about a company like Yamasa or, uh, or even Oregon Metaphone Growers, when you start to see the opportunities to build what we already have here and fill in the gaps, um, it's kind of, kind of growing the economy from within, which is, uh, I think, generally something that uh, the communities also support. Um, enterprise resource planning, we worked on a project with a company out of McMinnville called Buildable to provide an open source software for businesses to uh, um, develop their own enterprise ERP programs, which basically allows a small business to have all their different systems talking to each other. I, I don't pretend to really understand the details of it, but um, it's something that's largely been only available to the bigger companies, and uh, this is kind of a way to uh, smaller companies can engage in that. Uh, workforce is a challenge. You know, we talk about recruitment, and every time we have a recruitment, we kind of take a deep breath because are the workers here for those new uh, uh, new employers? Um, as we reach out to businesses, we're identifying new things that we can get involved in to help them. We have businesses that have said, you know, work uh, daycare is an important aspect of our to try to keep uh, retain and find workers. So we've uh, had some projects in Yamhill County around work uh, childcare development. Um, housing, um, workforce housing in particular is a challenge throughout the region, throughout, I think, the country, uh, certainly throughout the state. And uh, we're about to launch a project uh, working with uh, Newburgh Housing Consortium on some, um, how to find, a, a how to develop affordable um, housing that workers, local workers can, can live in. Um, incumbent worker training, um, one of the conversations that we have with businesses that they almost are, 
sheepish when they say, well, we may not be creating jobs, but we're trying to invest in new equipment so we can do more with the people we have. And we're, we're trying to own that a lot more and say, how can we help you do that? And we do have, we're one of 509 applications in front of the Economic Development Administration right now. So, um, you know, we're not counting the money yet. Uh, but what we're excited about is uh, it's for an incumbent worker-based training program where we would tie in work that the Oregon Manufacturing Extension Partnership can do with a business to identify uh, ways that they can um, adopt uh, new technology or new um, processing um, to increase their efficiency. And then working with Chemeca Community College and uh, the Willamette Workforce Partnership, how we can take the existing workers and skill them up and work them up a skill ladder in those businesses to take on those new, that new equipment. And it might mean basic skills, language skills, computer skills, and it might mean you know specific industry uh, um, training. Um, I think we feel we have a really strong product, even if it doesn't get funded by the, um, the federal government. I think we have the partnerships, and we had 20 businesses write letters of support. And when we've talked about it to other businesses, they've been you know kind of right on. So. Um, we're excited about that, and if it doesn't work out from a funding perspective, we'll try to figure out how we can uh, um, come up with some alternatives to, to try to put something together more formal in that regard. And then, kind of lastly, the industrial land inventory. You know, I've, uh, I've been kind of joking that we've hit the 20th anniversary of the issue around industrial lands in the state being identified. And uh, uh, anecdotally, we found a piece of paper in our files that dates back to 2002, I think, which was the governor's industrial lands task force and how we need industrial land. Um, I think there was still some work to be done back then because uh, you know some of our long-term sites that we've had in this region, I mentioned Staten earlier, um, Independence, Dallas, the AGT building in Dallas, which has been vacant for quite a while. Um, they're all off the market now and, and creating jobs and, create, and attracting investment. and. Um, we're going to be looking at that next step of where do we see ourselves putting these uh, facilities in the future. Um, I know there are several cities along in Marion County that are looking at economic opportunity analyses right now for future. Salem, uh, Woodburn, uh, I think has mentioned it. Um, then the work that's being done at uh, Brooks Hopmere. Um, maybe there's some opportunities to look at sort of a regional approach to industrial lands in Marion County um, in the future, but it's something I think is going to be really important for us. And obviously happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I appreciate the time today, too, to kind of tell you what we've been up to and uh, um, look forward to answering questions and hearing your ideas. Do you have any questions? I have some comments. Okay. Uh, I think one of the things that I just want to, uh, I don't know, reiterate is how um, lucky we are to have the leadership we have at, uh, at SEDCOR, um, especially on the executive board, which I serve. I've been really impressed with um, how much they care about the community. So um, Eric can talk about this. One of the things that they've been beating the drum on is how uh, what they want is, is they want everybody to know that their commitment to business development and job development and economic development in Marion County is really their commitment to the county. And, and that the reason why they do what they do is um, to provide good jobs, and to, to promote the economy of this community so, so that the whole community flourishes. It's not just about um, having jobs so people can make money, but it's about the schools and the public safety. And, and I think you see this with um, the way that Rich Duncan and Nick dove into the community center up in Detroit. Um, but that wasn't about anybody making money. That was really about a, a community in, in Marion County was really hurting, and, and these people did whatever they could to help try to bring that community back to life. And I, I think that's something that we should just be grateful for. Because I, I don't know that every community has that. You know, life is hard enough as it is, and there's a lot of people that are just putting their heads down, and they're trying to make as much money for their family as they can, and that's their focus. And um, there's nothing wrong with that, so long as they're not doing anything illegal or immoral uh, to, to get across <laughs> that finish line. But I think we're very blessed that here in Marion County, um, a lot of our business leaders, they, they spend their time and their money and their talent um, going above and beyond that and really giving back to the community and thinking about their businesses as community assets, not just um, things that are valuable for, for their sake. And so um, I'm grateful for that. And, and uh, Nick, I want to thank you 
in a special way because I just think we're part of the reason said core Marion County is successful is because you've been doing it for so long and you just know this community so well and and you sort of set it as a throwaway you know Detroit's different from Donald um, I'm not sure everybody who moved here for the first time would necessarily know that or know that as intimately as you do and um, and it's something that really makes our community rich is, is having these different places and different um, people that are proud of their their little piece of the world and um, so I, I think you're a big reason why we've had as much success and said course had as much success in this, in this community. So. Oh, Madam Chair, thank you. I, I just, again, I have a comment too, and Eric, it's directed at you when you said some businesses are sheepless. How did you say that? Sheepish. Sheepish, Sheepish. about saying they're not going to create a job, but they're going to invest in technology. And uh, I haven't, I've been pretty vocal about that. Um, and the reason why is because our state makes it harder and harder to compete in the world over there at that building. And um, we have to invest in technology. Yep. Uh, and, and, and we know that um, as, a, as a county commissioner, our revenue, I always say our sales department, comes from investment in property and technology and assets because that's where we get our property taxes from. Um, all the income taxes go over there and some of it comes <laughs> flows back in, in different ways. But uh, for us to be competitive in exporting, and, and I really appreciate, Nick, when you said that one business, eh, a little bit may stay here, but the rest of it's going to California or going over to Europe or wherever. The, this state could never, ever buy everything we could produce, right? So we have, to, we have to be competitive in a world, a national market and a world market. So anytime we get a chance to find, to help somebody be competitive by investing, and yeah, maybe they'll lose a job or maybe they won't create a job as a result of putting in a new computer system, but they're gonna create economic value. And those jobs will be paying higher than the manual jobs that um, maybe traditionally we've been used to in the Valley. and so trying to find ways to take our commodities and make them uh, into products and then export them is really, uh, you know, because we've got this, this uh, agricultural heritage that is our strength. And uh, I, I read something the other day where somebody, I think it was uh, John who wrote an article. In fact, it's going to be in your article on the 40 oh, yeah. years of SEDCOR. <laughs> and he said, what are our two assets? It's our people and our soil. And uh, so our people and our soil, but turning that into to higher paying jobs with technology is really important. Really appreciate what you all do and, and, and what your focus has been uh, in the last few years of, of even looking at the small businesses. Because it's I've always said this in the restaurant business, it's easier to retain a customer than it is to go get a new one. Oh, yeah. So retention and helping them be, be successful. So thank you for what you do. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. You know, when, when we mentioned that, I think a lot of economic development organizations have been known for just like, you know, their, their, their metrics or deal flow. You know, it's not necessarily the story, it's the numbers. And we're, um, those are important and we understand that, but uh, when you do talk to a business, they expect to be, you know, say, we'll be more interested if they're going to be creating a lot of jobs. And, and frankly, we're understanding that the opportunities are kind of filling in the gaps there and, and making them stronger and, and, and keeping their employees there by allowing them to be more competitive because yeah. if they can't keep up there's uh, an international uh, market right now that um, you know we'll see to the fact that if they don't they can't have challenges to survive here and we have some of the you know like I use this as a positive uh, scrappiest entrepreneurs in, in the farming and agriculture industries in particular because you know they deal with different kinds of strife every season and every year and uh, whether it's whether it's weather or markets or competition um, and to see the kinds of things that they look at to add value to what they do and, and as the generations come in um, new opportunities also it's the reason why we've done the uh, Ag Innovation Hub. I think that's uh, an investment for us to look at that industry and uh, help be sure that it's uh, uh, stay strong and stronger and going into the future. Um, you've also heard this example, I think, before, some of you may have, but uh, you know, when you tour a company like Crosby Hop Farm and you start to see that not only do they grow those hops and sell them to 3,000 accounts around the, around the world, um, they're using DK Fab equipment. and 
you start to see that, you know, Chris Sarles or Oregon Fruit sells them, you know, fruits for, or, or sells some of those same breweries, fruits for flavoring. And um, we know we have brewers, we know we have packaging, we know we have businesses that sell them retail. And uh, you realize that there's a whole ecosystem in just, you know, one crop. And you look at every one of the crops that we grow and there's just so much opportunity for value added um, chain development there. It's really exciting for us. I like that one crop at the end product, too. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> yeah, that helps. <laughs> well, thank you, commissioners, for your comments. Um, I just want to say on the record how grateful I am for you, Nick. I've only been a commissioner for a little over a year, but I came in, obviously, in a <laughs> fast and furious way with my passion for community development. And I think that said Port Addy, and that is their fourth arm or triangle, is uh, really the heart of what Marion County is. I think what we do here as commissioners is truly community development and I've been able to partner with Nick um, since the wildfire on just about every step of recovery and I want to say thanks to Matt because he sent me just a quick text to remind me that if it wasn't for Nick, the engineering for our tiny cabins that we're bringing up the canyon wouldn't have gotten done. And if it wasn't for Nick, um, the tiny home project overall wouldn't be done. And also if it wasn't for Nick, 10 homeowners through the Christian Aid Ministries program wouldn't be done. So I don't think people really understand the gravity of what you provide to Marion County. And I heard you say 15 years and eight months, and I apologize for the emotion. I hope you're not trying to leave anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> because we have a lot of work to do. And I'm just grateful for you. And I know that this is emotional hard work for you. And I, I've just watched you perform and answer the phone and send the emails so rapidly that SEDCOR is extremely lucky to have you. And um, I hope someday there's some award in honor of your name for the things that get done in this community because it truly is a testament to the heart of what you do for the county. So thank you so much for everything. Thank you. Yeah. So anyway, thank you for your presentation. It's been some time. It's not happened since I've been here as a commissioner and I appreciate all the information. Tamara, thanks for making it happen. And we look forward to seeing you back you know, in a few months sure. on the new things. And I looked up Tillamook Country Smokers while you were talking, and just so happens that on their website is a comment that says, we drive the extra hour from Seaside to Tillamook before any big road trip to make sure we stock up on at least four or five pounds of jerky for the road. It's my favorite snack any time of day. And it's from a gentleman named Matt Wilkinson. And I thought, I wonder if that's the start of him. <laughs> so I text him, and he said no. But he looks forward to them opening up in Silverton. <laughs> and I hope that when they get going, we can learn about them locally sourcing beef for their, their jerky. For those that don't know, they're a beef jerky company. And um, I hope I can be there for that opportunity, because I think it's a great addition to Marion County. So. Yeah, they've been very good about engaging with us. Um, and, and Nick's helped them engage with the city of Silverton as well and just all the different pieces that go into that kind of project coming to a community. But they're um, at the heart, kind of a really small business. So they're, they're really good folks to work with. That's great. Well, thank you all thank for you. being here today. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Chair Beth, if I could, I just, I wanted to make a comment uh, sort of on the long lines that Commissioner Cameron um, said, I think it's important. Um, we're in a world now where we have to compete globally mm -hmm. in order to succeed, um, especially uh, to survive whatever the next downturn might be if it comes. So um, one of the things that I appreciate about SEDCOR is, is their focus on our local businesses being able to compete globally. Because a lot of times we focus on small businesses, local businesses, buy local and all that, and that's all good. Um, but if our businesses can't compete locally, um, our whole... Uh, economy, our schools, everything will will really be in trouble. So um, that was. I appreciate you making that point, Commissioner. Okay, now we're going to move on to a proclamation, and I think and there's. I wish I don't know if that, uh, the cameras could pan to the audience, but it's very bright in here today. <laughs> I keep and it's up here too. All over our desks, this bright fluorescent orange. So we're going to consider the approval of a proclamation declaring April 11th through the 15th, 2022 as Work Zone Awareness Week in Marion County and recognizing today, April 13th, 2022, as Go Orange Day. And we're joined by a few members of Public Works who will introduce themselves. I'll start. Good morning. Lonnie Radke, County Engineer, Public Works. Good morning. Scott Wilson, Operations Division Manager for Public Works. 
Good morning, Carl Lund, Traffic Engineer, Marion County Public Works. Thank you. So today we're here to discuss the importance of safety, in this case especially in construction work zones, and we're asking that we take a little bit of time to recognize the benefits of increasing awareness um, to the public and, and remind ourselves the importance of driving focused and alert, especially, this, this can be everywhere and it should be everywhere, but today especially in our construction work zones. Um, we're requesting that the commissioners recognize and procre proclaim this week, uh, April 11th through the 15th, as Work Zone Awareness Week in Marion County. Just to give you a little background, nationwide there are obviously thousands of workers working um, in or near traffic and they're putting their lives at risk to maintain our facilities, to construct improvements that the public gets to benefit from on our roads and, and off of our roads and our facilities. And in 1999, the Federal Highway Administration and American Association of State and Highway Transportation Officials recognized work zone crashes as a safety concern and established this nationwide safety campaign, um, this Work Zone Awareness Week. Um, in order to increase awareness um, of those putting their lives at risk and to help the public make safe decisions for themselves and the people working in these, in these work zones. This year's theme, as you can see on the slide, is work zones are assigned to slow down. Um, just to give you a little information here, nationwide, uh, recently, our, our recent data shows that in 2019, about 842 people were killed in work zones. Um, this is almost three people every single day in 2019 that either were driving home, driving to work, working their jobs to put food on the table for their families, and they did not make it home that night. So this is um, definitely a problem that we want to try to help um, improve. At Marion County, oops, at Marion County, we have over 200 employees, a lot of whom work in or near traffic, um, plus we hire a lot of contractors, and there are a lot of contractors out there doing private work. So we have a lot of work zones happening throughout Marion County, and again, these people are all putting their lives at risk to maintain our roads and provide benefits to the public. Um, one of our core values at um, Public Works is safety, and that is in a couple of different ways. Internally, we are ensuring that we're providing training, um, the resources and equipment needed to um, ensure that our employees are making safe choices and that they're protected as best as possible, but also for the general public to make sure that we are um, improving safety as best as we can and, and appropriately setting up work zones so that the driving public can navigate through the work zones as safely as possible to protect themselves, but also our workers. Um, this safety campaign comes at the perfect time of year. We're getting ready to um, really ramp up our construction activities through the spring and summer, and we're getting more work done than ever. I uh, really want to recognize how hard our workers are working and our contractors as well. And unfortunately, this is paired with uh, a problem with distracted driving being at an all-time high. Um, through COVID, we saw speeds, vehicle speeds, increase dramatically, and unfortunately, crashes and fatalities increasing. So this is a really important time right now to stop and take a moment to, to understand how important it is to be focused and alert. I'd like to turn it over to Scott to talk about what we're doing at Public Works this week. Um, so this week, uh, in recognition of the Awareness Week, uh, we're launching an internal training video just uh, for public works staff to get familiar with the components of a work zone and what that means, and um, and it helps uh, some of the folks that may not be out uh, out in the field doing some work, but also uh, some of the office work and the administration folks can also get familiar with that in case uh, there is a need um, to go through a work zone or, or maybe going on the way home. Um, and of course, as you notice, today is uh, April 13th. It's uh, National Orange Go Orange Day, so I appreciate everybody participating with that. Um, and in addition, every day this week, we're focusing on, a, on an individual within, within our Public Works team and what they do and how important um, safety is for, for the public and what they do. So um, this shot here, I love this shot. It, it uh, shows some of the, the folks that we have um, Recognizing who they are, they range from uh, Kelsey, she's uh, one of our maintenance workers, Reyes, um, works on our vegetation crew, medium equipment operator. We have, we have Eric, um, one of our traffic um, engineer uh, technicians. Um, 
we also have Jacob. He's one of our striping crew uh, medium equipment operators and also one of our uh, flagging instructors that we have that we do our internal training with that to get the certification. Um, and in addition to, um, I brought some of our value team members um, uh, here just to uh, show support too of uh, making sure that we have enough orange in the room. Uh, so I think, I think that's very effective. So uh, keep a lookout on that uh, on uh, Facebook and, um, and you know, just uh, want to make sure that, just ensure that they are passionate about taking care of our roads, um, also the, their teammates and ensuring that our work zones are safe for the traveling public. Thank you. Commissioners, uh, Carl Lund again. Um, so when you're in a work zone, what can you do? Uh, the most important thing is to slow down. Uh, according to the Institute at the uh, International, excuse me, the uh, Institute of Traf Transportation Engineers, um, if a person is hit by a moving vehicle, the odds of surviving at 20 miles per hour is 90%. The odds of surviving at 30 miles per hour is 60% and the odds of surviving at 40 miles per hour is only 20%. So when you're in a work zone, please slow down. Uh, the people are not necessarily in vehicles. They're often on the ground working and a fast collision can kill them. Um, also, please pay attention. Uh, in today's world, uh, we have uh, cell phones, which are designed to gain our attention, uh, and the companies working uh, on apps and on um, for those phones are very good at obtaining that attention. And so it's important that we make a conscious effort to choose to pay attention to the road and not pay attention to our apps while we are driving because just a few seconds lapse of um, paying attention can result in, in a collision. Thank you. So on that, we would like to ask that you proclaim this week April 11th through April 15th as Work Zone Awareness Week in Marion County. Thank you. Do you have any questions before we read the proclamation? Make a motion. Would you like me to make that motion? Sure. Okay, I'd be happy to, Madam Chair. I'll move that we approve a proclamation declaring April 11th through the 15th, 2022 as Work Zone Awareness Week in Marion County and recognizing April 13th, 2022 as Go Orange Day. And you know what? I had people texting me saying, is this a beaver day? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't figure you'd have no, a shortage didn't. of orange I, I'm ties that and clothes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we actually did have this debate last night about which closet he was going to find the orange ties in. <laughs> I don't have any orange you ties, it? but that's why I'm going to. You want to second that? Uh, I do want to second that. All right, good. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Would you like to start to make the proclamation? Sure, I would love to. Okay. The matter of proclaiming the week, April 11th through 15th, 2022, as Work Zone Awareness Week in Marion County, a proclamation. This matter came before the Marion County Board of Commissioners at its regularly scheduled public meeting on April 13th, 2022. Whereas the safety of the public, including Marion County workers and contractors, is of the utmost importance to Marion County, and whereas there were 842 deaths in construction work zones th throughout the U.S. in 2019. And? And whereas there is a national safety campaign to increase awareness of work zone <laughs> safety throughout the U.S. and whereas data and trends show vehicle speeds and crash frequencies increasing throughout the U.S. and whereas distracted driving is identified as a common crash cause throughout the U.S. and Whereas the number of construction activities and associated construction work zones are continuing to increase throughout Marion County. And whereas Marion County Public Works is committed to the safety of the public and workers in Marion County construction work zones by pri prioritizing safety, raising awareness, and stressing the importance of focused and alert driving through work zones. Now, therefore, it is hereby proclaimed that the week of April 11th through the 15th, 2022, is Work Zone Awareness Week in Marion County, dated at Salem, Oregon, the 13th day of April, 2022. So, we're going to take a picture with all of you, including you on the back wall. You come up front. I know, you came for a reason. It was for a photo, did they tell you? <laughs> I don't want a ribbon. I don't want to wear your vest or oh, come on. even all day. Can I have one of these for a bit more? Take as many look at <laughs> Take as many as you want. Hey. Uh, I, 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 I have more about it. I 
The question is, are you wearing a hat? That's the real question. We, you know, I didn't get your cowboy card. <laughs> Next time. Next time. I want one, though. That's true. Volunteer appreciation. Can we call the treasurer and have him bring down donuts? <laughs> oh my gosh. Good point. What is that treasurer doing? <laughs> donuts? Okay. We are going to move on to the consent calendar. Where under where under finance we're, we're going to um, approve one contract for sale for tax account 33121 for Michael and Alice Esplin and one quick claim deed for tax accounts 510917 and 343108 for Willie Denson and Kathy Olson for the sale of tax foreclosed properties back to the prior record owners. And under tax office, approve an order for a property tax refund in the amount of $33,885.28 for First American Title Company. I know I read that. It's because you guys are busy. Can somebody uh, make Madam, Chair, <laughs> Madam Chair, I'll move the consent calendar as read. Thank you. I'll second the motion. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Aye, the motion passes. And now we're gonna move on to our first action item under Board of Commissioners to consider approval of orders appointing members to the governing body of the Idana Detroit Rural Fire Protection District to fill existing vacancies. And Chad Ball is gonna join us. What happened to your orange vest? Oh, they had to take it back. Oh, I, oh, I got one. <laughs> <laughs> you want a ribbon? No, I think I'm good, I have a vest oh, okay. on my okay. Oh, fine. Okay. Right. Good morning, Chair Bethel and Commissioners. Uh, for the record, Chad Ball with the Board's Office. Uh, before you today is, um, for your consideration, the approval of orders appointing members of the governing body to the Idana Detroit Rural Fire Protection District to fill existing vacancies. Um, for a little bit of background, the Idana Detroit uh, Fire District is a special district. Uh, members are usually appoint or selected by, um, through an election. However, in March of this year, four members resigned and leaving the Board without a quorum. So pursuant to ORS 198320 section 1, the duty of appointing new board members falls to the Board of Commissioners because there is no quorum to select new members on the um, governing board. Uh, those appointed today will have a term ending June 30th, 2023. Uh, this is in accordance with OAR, ORS 198320 section 2. Um, an election will be held in May of 2023 to fill the remaining terms. Uh, just so you know, if um, if the seat was up for election of that year, the person will fill out a full four-year term. If it wasn't, it was, it was an off year, the person being elected in that term will fill out a two-year term, a one-year term, whatever that term may be. They're filling the existing term. Um, so in 2023, you'll have some existing terms filled and then some new terms being filled. Great. When they went for election. Thank you for clarifying that. Oh. We were confused on how they would rotate that out. Yes. I'm not sure if I may, but... So, so are they numbered like our position one position two so are they numbered so as we go through this we need to make sure we assign a name to a position 
if that's the case. I am, I'd have to look at legal counsel for that. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Do we? You have to know like who's going to be going out. Right. Yeah. Well, they're all up for election in 2020. They, they, they all have to run again. They all have to run again. They fill the seat until next election cycle in the spring of 2023. And then that election cycle is when the seat, they apply, they apply to run for each individual seat, which is either a two-year term or a four-year term. Okay. Correct. And the election works it out. Yes. Okay. Thank so you. So we don't have to do that. We That's right. Okay. So, um, so okay. Just, just so if they just need to know that they don't apply for the, two of them don't apply for the same position yeah, in two years. They'll have there. to figure that out amongst themselves, right? Yeah, I would think that Special Districts Association of Can Oregon would be able to support them through that and their legal counsel. Okay. They, they have legal counsel and Thank you for, to help them with that. Yes. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah. Um, the applicants before you today are Greg Dyke, Brandon Hamilton, Matt Lofton, Teresa Mauerman, and Serena Moranis. Uh, did, we did hold apple, or, uh, interviews on Monday. It was open to the public to view, and now it's for your consideration. Thank you. So commissioners, we have not had an opportunity to have any deliberations since Monday because we had the interviews and then we wanted to hold this discussion in the public, which is why we're doing it today. Um, and it's a little unorthodox because we're not asking questions and kind of deciding um, in the moment. So I'm just curious if how you wanted to proceed um, in your thoughts, if you each wanted to share individually for each person that you heard from, um, or if you just wanted to dive into who you wanted to support. I'd be happy to just sort of talk about my impressions based on our interview and, Great. and then you guys, if you want, or however okay? you want to do it. Okay, let's do that, thank you. So um, I was in, uh, impressed. I thought uh, Brandon Hamilton had a good handle on the fire work, what it meant to be a fire chief, and, and um, he has an extensive background in um, working for uh, fire departments and being chief of a fire department, and so I thought he would be um, helpful um, to to the organization. So he was somebody that I I thought would be a good uh, a good addition, somebody that I would recommend appointing to the board. Uh, I thought Matthew Lofton he has worked on um, some of the the trucks and um, lives up there and sort of see, he seemed to know. Um, the people and some of the challenges that the organization has faced in, um, in a more intimate way and some of the facilities challenges that they're going to face. And so I thought he would be a good addition. Um, and then I, uh, I, I thought Teresa Marmon um, had just a really good positive perspective and a heart for service. And so I, um, I liked her attitude. Um, and then I thought Serena Moronis, um, she really focused on the organization needing to be professional, and um, she has a background in accounting, and so I thought that would be helpful for the organization. So I think those were the, the four that stood out to me in the process. Okay, thank you. Do you want to go before me? Nope. Okay, um, I just wanted to offer that option. I mean, I can. I'm, I'm ready to do all of it. If, if you're ready to be the decision maker here, okay. So um, I, I will, I, you know, <laughs> I just thought all four of them, uh, or five of them, did a great job uh, interviewing, and I really appreciate. It. I said this on the record that they all stood up uh, and said, "Hey, I want to do this." They all have a heart for service for the right reasons in their own minds, and um, uh, I want to encourage them. And I said this on the record that in a small little community like Detroit or Idana, to do double duty, because mm -hmm. I'm on the planning commission and other things that we do up there. As a, as a resident. So I'm going to say this, that um, my, my uh, four that I would want to, if we're going to do, if we're going to do a slate, uh, would be for the same reasons that uh, Commissioner Willis said, I'd say Brandon Dyke, Brandon Hamilton, Matt Laf Lofton, and Serena Moore. So I have, I have her as her accounting background and finance background. Um, and uh, those were the four that, that I would choose. However, as I said, Teresa would be just fine too, but I just thought that um, uh, having that finance background um, would probably be a really good thing based on everything that's happened up there 
uh, in the past and the money that's kind of flowed in from the legislature, et cetera. So those would be uh, the four that I would um, put forward as a slate. And for the record, Commissioner, I just wanted to confirm it was Greg Dyke. I think I heard Brandon. But. Did I say Greg Dyke, Brandon Hamilton, Matthew Lofton, and Serena Moronis. Moronis. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, I um, have to say that I don't actually know all these individuals, but they performed very well on Monday, and I took several pages of notes, and I am um, highly impressed with the commitment that each one of the five um, has to the Identity Detroit community. Um, listening to each of them and as to why they want to participate in the filling of these seats is truly to move not just the fire district, but the community and the recovery of the canyon forward. And I found that to be just really inspiring. And each of them has their own pride points. Uh, but they each also have individual experiences that I think will um, promote the next steps and opportunity and bring the community together. And each of them really spoke about that. Um, specifically, Greg Dyke. Um, I'll be supporting him for this because I um, really appreciate his extensive fire background and his current retirement. Um, so he has a lot of availability to really pour into the work that needs to occur up there. Um, second will be uh, for me, Brandon Hamilton. Also for similar reasons, um, he's been instrumental in a lot of the recovery up there. I actually have interacted with him um, during the fire and appreciate his commitment to to the recovery and they both Greg and Brandon bring a wealth of resources from across the state from the fire service up to this organization which I believe is going to be extremely critical to be able to dig down into some of the forensic needs that they have to um, stabilize and grow and then thirdly um, Matthew Lofton I appreciated that he actually lives in Detroit um, having uh, Local lived citizens, first homeowners on this board of directors, I believe is important. And I also appreciated that he shared, similar to what you expressed, Commissioner Willis, that he's been a volunteer on the equipment, um, in the community, uh, the building. He understands a lot of the challenges that they have for the infrastructure. Um, and I believe has been following some of the funding sources to be able to get boots on the ground right away and move forward. Um, and then my fourth pick is gonna be Serena Moronis. Also, because she lives in Idana, that equal important on the ground, lives up there, directly impacted by this every day, her family, um, and also her, her forensic ability in the CPA. She's a CPA. Um, she brings a wealth of skill and knowledge to the board, and um, they're in a financial disarray, and they need to have somebody that doesn't have to, to learn how to move forward, but can just step in and give direction and recruit some support to really get their finances in order. So those would be my four, four to pick, but I don't want anyone to think um, that I'm remiss to re recognize Teresa Marmon and her, her strengths and abilities and what she brings to the community up there. Um, she's very vocal, and I believe she'll be very present regardless um, of this appointment. Um, and I would encourage her to continue to seek opportunities to engage and to really um, move that community's recovery forward, which is what she was passionate about. So my four are Greg, Brandon, uh, Matthew and Serena. Are you comfortable with a motion on the ones that we have majorities on? It sounds like Gregory Dyke has two votes. Brandon Hamilton has three. Matthew Lofton has three. Teresa would have one. Serena would have three. So we would appoint Gregory, Brandon, Matthew, and Serena. Is that? Are you asking? I, I'm confused are you comfortable? Are you comfortable with me making that motion? For, the motion for the four. For the four for Gregory, Brandon, Matthew. And Serena. I am. Are you comfortable with that? Well, I I would move. Sounds like we have uh, two votes for Serena as well. We have three votes three for votes. Serena. Oh, did you say Serena? I said Serena. Yep. Oh, yes. okay. Yeah. So the only one we wouldn't move for would be Teresa, because she didn't get a majority. Yeah. So slate with those four. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Please. Okay, Madam Chair, I would move uh, that we approve order an order or orders appointing the following members to the governing body of the Idana Detroit Rural Fire Protection District to fill existing vacancies. Gregory Dyke, Brandon Hamilton, Matthew Lofton, and Serena Moronis. I'll second that motion. Thank you, I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And before we move on, the motion passes. I just wanna say thank you to our staff 
uh, specifically Chad Ball, who we were um, notified before final resignations of the previous board were present, and you were on standby waiting for the process to uh, work its way out. Um, and then also our legal counsel. This has never happened in Marion County history, and um, thank you to the Oregon Revised Statute that provides guidelines, but they're a, a little historical, and so we had to do some, they had to do some legalese over there to make it really work. And I appreciate you, Chad, executing this in such a timely manner because this is an important responsibility for the recovery of the canyon, and now those four um, can join their other counterpart and get to work. So thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, moving on to our next action item under community services to consider approval of the software of the software as a service contract with Galaxis Incorporated in the amount of $132,440 to provide community resource network license, annual maintenance, and hosting services retroactive to July 1, 2021, excuse me, June 30th, 2026. Tamara. Good morning, Commissioners. Again, Tamara Getch, uh, Director for Community Services. It's been quite a few years that this particular program has been within Marion County. However, it's been under a donation uh, of ta time and talent from uh, or individuals that are within Galaxis. This contract would transfer uh, this program off of the county server and put it into a cloud-based service that will allow us to have upgrades um, pretty quickly as needed so that we can better serve the community. Uh, the Community Resource Network is a software system that is a membership, free membership program for organizations who work with individuals in our community who are being case managed. Uh, and the goal is for us to be the last uh, organization, the last place for them to go when they have a gap in service or supports, mostly supports. So for example, an organization, let's say the health department, could put something in here as a request for clothing for one of their clients that they haven't been able to secure otherwise. And it would go into this system and then put out through an email system to other organizations who are interested in filling those needs. This, we also have a branch of this that is more philanthropic in nature. So we have individuals and organizations in our community who have an abundance of things or they wish to make an investment in unfilled needs that exist in our community and they can use this system as a technology to help them match their personal or organizational um, mission or desire and filling the needs of people in our community. So this contract allows us to do all of these things uh, as well as start it um, to be delivered through a software as a service um, based on the cloud rather than on Marion County's uh, server. Open to any questions. Well, Tamara, we talked about how um, this is really meant to fill gaps in our community and how there, there are other providers who are more specific to certain types of service, um, like healthcare services and that sort of thing. And we talked about how we were going to have a meeting um, to just tighten up some of the process language around here. Is that on the books yet? It is not on the books, but it's here uh, on my notes that we will be setting a meeting for us to work with uh, you commissioners to look at uh, the terms of use and to walk through that. We have those drafted, but needing to work through legal counsel, uh, have brought it up to our council, uh, assigned council person to say that we need to be working through those details. Have you talked to the board's office about getting that meeting scheduled? No, and that's why I was saying it's it's we're working behind the scenes right now, make sure that we're ready for that meeting, and then we'll be um, scheduling that with the board. Will you reach out to the board and and get most a certainly? Date? Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? All right, then I so, will take a motion. Yeah, sure. Madam Thank Chair, you. I'll move that we approve the software of service SAS SAAS contract with Galaxix Inc in the amount of $132,440 to provide community resource network license, annual maintenance, and hosting 
services retroactive to July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2026. I'll second the motion. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion passes. Thanks, Thank Tamara. you. All right. Now we're going to move on to public works to consider approval of the purchase order with Fastenal Company in the amount of $300,000 for the purchase of safety clothing, parts, and operational supplies for June 30th, 2023. Good morning, Dennis. Good morning, Commissioners. And? Good morning, Jason Sykes. Good morning, <laughs> Coming Jason. Public Works. I've brought a special guest with it. For the record, I'm Dennis Mansfield. I'm the Administration Division Manager here at Public Works. And uh, Jason, can you introduce yourself? Uh, for the record, it's Jason Sykes, uh, Marion County Public Works Fleet and Communications Supervisor. And uh, Jason's here to help me with uh, any questions you may have related to this purchase order. He's helped driving that. Um, before I actually get to the purchase order, um, I kind of want to recognize Jason a little bit. Um, Jason, as you mentioned, is our fleet and communications supervisor. He's been with us for about two and a half years. Um, and uh, I have to say, he has been an, a wonderful asset to our organization. Um, his dedication and hard work has been amazing. Um, a couple of things I want to highlight that I think it really kind of builds into why that we're here today with the Fastenal purchase order is um, a couple of key strengths that Jason has. Um, uh, building relationships and getting things done. And I can't think of a, a better example um, than in our recent uh, wildfire. Um, Jason led the effort in getting our uh, mobile radio communication tower in place. So um, if you recall, we lost um, a communication, a critical communication site up at Hall Ridge, just above uh, Detroit Lake. Um, that's where uh, Marion County Sheriff's Office uh, radio communications are, METCOM 911 communications, where they dispatch um, the uh, ambulance services, as well as Lynn County Sheriff's Office, were all at this site. Um, it was Jason who led and coordinated the effort to get the mobile communication tower purchased and installed. Um, I can't underscore the amount of work um, and the coordination effort that it took to do that. Um, <clears throat> Uh, one of the key things that really stuck out to me was uh, when we finally actually got the tower in place or tower received at a, uh, the public works site, um, he coordinated and led uh, four or five radio communication vendors all huddled around this um, tower to put on their equipment, get the um, generator working appropriately, getting everything all lined up. And if you know a little bit about the radio uh, business, uh, radio vendors are very uh, competitive and don't work well together. And yet here they all are working together for a common goal to get this mobile <laughs> tower in place. Um, he also worked with the state forestry to make sure that we could actually utilize a specific piece of land to be able to put this mobile tower in place. Um, and also with our public work staff to help take down some of the burnt trees. So if the wind came, we didn't to, uh, hit the tower. There was a lot of logistics to this and Jason led it all. Um, and we actually had that mobile tower up and running within three weeks of the fire. Um, and so I just wanted to take a moment and say, Jason, thank you. Thank I you, really sir. do appreciate your service. Um, and it really does come to the building relationships piece um, and really why we're here with Fastenal today. So on that purchase order um, you see in front of you, we're requesting a, a, an increase uh, to $300,000 through June of 2023. So it'll be the first year that we'll have spent over $100,000 um, with Fastenal within the Public Works Department. We anticipate spending about 153, sorry, 150,000 through the end of this year and continuing that relationship relationship into next year. So instead of coming now to just a bump at this fiscal year, we figured we'd do this fiscal year and next fiscal year through June 2023. Um, this relationship with Fastenal has been growing um, largely in part because of Jason's relationship with them. Um, we originally started with Fastenal back in 2019 before Jason came on board. Um, they gave us a vending machine to utilize. I mean, kind of think of snacks and chips and stuff like that, but instead of that, we're putting safety supplies in there. We've got our safety vests that we have on are in there. We've got gloves. We've got all kinds of different items that we put in place. And that first year before Jason came on board, the, the, the items in there weren't moving very much. We only had about $2,000 worth of spend in there. And in the last calendar year, 2021, we've spent 10 times more of that. About $20,000 are moving through that vending machine. And why is that important? It's important because it's really helping us save time and money. So if you think of all of our road operations staff coming in at seven o'clock in the morning, 
before we had the vending machines, they were having to go to the parts room and go, hey, I need a pair of gloves, I need a vest, I need whatever it is I need for the day. And oftentimes there would be a line out the door waiting for service. Um, there's paperwork that goes with that. We want to make sure that when they request that, that they get charged out to the appropriate fund, et cetera. Our part staff are diligently working to try and get that processed. Um, today, an employee can go in, take their Marion County badge, scan the badge to the vending machine, pull out what they need, they got what they want and they can go on for the day. It's a huge time saver, also a huge saver on administrative costs. We get monthly reports um, that show what employees have taken out of the vending machine with a monthly invoice to pay for those um, items, which is also another key thing. All of the items in the vending machine are actually owned by Fastenal until we utilize them. Um, so it's not inventory that we've already paid for, it's Fastenal's inventory. And an additional level of service, um, our Marion County logo on the back, they've actually done that at their cost and then they put the, um, the these into the vending machine and won't bill us for that until we actually pull a vest out of the vending machine. So um, that is one area of the, uh, for uh, request of this purchase order. Another uh, key piece is um, our nuts and bolts program. So you can imagine uh, when we're we have over 600 pieces of equipment and vehicles that we're maintaining. Um, we go through a lot of nuts and bolts. And prior to our program with Fastenal, um, we were really relying on our mechanics or staff to let us know, hey, this nut or this bolt or this washer is out, um, or we're getting low on that. Um, and oftentimes, we could run into a situation where they're completely out and they need it for you know repairing something now all of a sudden they can't do that they're stopped working on that piece of equipment and then having to go through the parts room and then they're ordering it could take a couple of days depending on the type of nuts and bolts now we have Fastenal coming in three days a week and actually just filling our we actually literally have a wall of nuts and bolts in building too we have so many different sizes and kinds um, and they come in see where we're at on our inventory levels and fill them up they give us a packing slip show us what they filled we confirm that sign off and then they give us an invoice at the end of the month. Again, saving a lot of paperwork and time and making sure that when we need those nuts, bolts, and washers in place, they're there and available to our mechanics. Um, additional note on this as well, um, is this, this is through a, a NASPO uh, cooperative agreement. It's a national um, cooperative uh, agency that um, allows us to use these agreements. However, our part staff have done some really great work um, in putting quotes together. We did a, a recent quote of over close to 100 different items that we use on a regular basis um, and compared that to other vendors. Um, on, on average, Fastenal is 10% cheaper than other vendors. So um, not only are we getting a good quality of service, we're also getting good pricing, um, and we continue to um, want to build that relationship with Fastenal. So with that, it is uh, staff's recommendation to approve the uh, Fastenal purchase order of $300,000 through June of 2023, and we're here to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Do you have any questions? All right, would you make the motion, please? Oh, I would. Madam Chair, I move that we approve the purchase order with Fastenal Company in the amount of $300,000 for the purchase of safety, clothing, parts, and operational supplies through June 30th, 2023. I'll second the motion. All right, I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Aye, the motion passes. Thank you, Dennis Great. and Thank Jason. And Jason, yeah. thanks for all your work. Thank you. Yeah, nice Thank to you. see you. Cool stuff. All right, now we're going to move on to the Sheriff's Office, and Car Commander Carvondi is going to join us to consider approval of Amendment Number 2 to the Contract for Services with the Center for Hope and Safety to add $69,485.78 for a new contract total of $255,211.78 to provide victim services through June 30th, 2023. Good morning, Chair. Members of the Board, for the record, Commander Kevin Carvondi with the Sheriff's Office Community Corrections Division. and. Just to provide a little bit of background with regards to the funding stream for this particular contract, uh, this is directly associated with our Justice Reinvestment Grant Agreement in contract with the Criminal Justice Commission. As the board's aware, uh, Justice Reinvestment's primary funding uh, financially supports local counties to meet uh, the goals of Justice Reinvestment, and so we have a variety of different uh, prison reentry and diversion programs and services to meet those goals. Also, as part of this funding stream through Justice Reinvestment, 10% of the grant funds are to be allocated to community-based nonprofit organizations that provide services to victims of crime. Uh, Center for Hope and Safety is one of two victim service agencies approved by the Public Safety Coordinating Council to receive these funds. 
Uh, rewinding the clock three, four months ago in December of 2021, we re finally received our uh, award, final notice award letter from the Criminal Justice Commission and contract outlining uh, the, the confirmation of our final uh, funding allocation inclusive of, so it was two grants, the formula grant and the supplemental grant. And the supplemental grant is the one that was competitive and was one of the variables of the funding at the end of the day. Uh, at that time, several contracts were identified needing some amendments. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an example of that. Uh, this contract amendment will bring us in alignment with the Justice Reinvestment Approved Program budget. Uh, con the contract with Center for Hope and Safety is to provide services to victims of sexual assault, domestic violence, stalking, and human trafficking in Marion County. Uh, these contract funds primarily support multiple advocacy staff positions, uh, a bilingual advocate intake coordinator, and IT specialist advocate as well as funding associated with providing direct services to support victims uh, in terms of uh, getting identification, bus tickets, gas vouchers, prescriptions, and those, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, the original contract uh, was in the amount of $185,726 from July 1, 2021 through June 30th of 2023. This contract amendment adds just over $69,000 to the original contract, uh, leaving the contract total of $255,211.78. The additional funds will allow them to expand, uh, Center for Open Safety to allow them to expand in both their advocacy staff positions and direct services they provide to the individuals each year. I'm available for any questions. When you say expand, do you mean just increase the time commitment that we're paying for, or are they adding more staff? No, not more staff. If you look at, I believe it's Exhibit C, outlines the payment schedule and, and the budget, uh, just to kind of show the before and the after uh, current contract with the uh, percentage associated of funding each of the positions and then after the percentage uh, in increases. Page six. It's right here. Do you have any questions, Commissioner? No, this seems like a good thing. <laughs> it is a good thing. I think we should do it. Okay. Mr. Cameron, do you have any questions? Sure. Nope. Okay, would uh, you please make the motion? Madam Chair, I'll move to approve amendment number two of the contract for services of the Center for Hope and Safety to add $69,485.78 pennies for a new contract total of $255,211.78 pennies to provide victim services through June 30th, 2023. I'll second the motion. The motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion passes. Thank you, Thank you. Nice to see you. All right, now we'll move on to the reading of the calendar, which is super long. Commissioner Willis. I think it's my job. I've been, <laughs> oh, I've been ducking it the last couple of weeks. <laughs> okay, uh, well, today is April 13th, it's, uh, 1047, and we just completed our board session in the Senator Hearing Room, first floor of 555 Court Street Northeast in Salem. At 1.15 today, we have a BOCCAO meeting with an executive session if needed. Pursuant to ORS 192.6602 ABDEFHI, located in the Commissioner's Boardroom, the fifth floor of this building, 555 Court Street, Northeast in Salem. At 2.30 this afternoon, we have another BOCCAO with an executive session if needed. Pursuant to ORS 192.6602 ABDEFHI, located in the Commissioner's Boardroom, on the fifth floor of this building. That's 555 Court Street, Northeast in Salem. Do you think she has two back-to-back -back just because she knows I hate two-hour meetings? Do you think that's what happened there? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it is valid. I did check. Two, two one-hour meetings instead of one two-hour yeah. meeting. That's, that's cute. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> on Thursday, tomorrow, April 14th at 7.30 in the morning, we have a city's Marion County meeting located at Sherry's Restaurant. That's 4998 River Road North in Kaiser. Uh, tomorrow, Thursday at 9 a.m., we have a Economic Development Update Work Session located in the Commissioner's Boardroom, fifth floor of this building. That's 555 Court Street Northeast in Salem. <laughs> On Thursday, April 14th at 11 a.m., we have another work session. Uh, it's a CDBG resale recapture policy located in the Commissioner's Boardroom on the fifth floor of this building. That's 555 Court Street Northeast in Salem. And then on Thursday, uh, April 14th at 1.30 in the afternoon, we have a Health and Human Services work session regarding public health modernization and behavioral health housing in uh, the 2022 legislative allocation. That's located in the commissioner's boardroom on the fifth floor of this building, 555 Court Street Northeast in Salem. On April 14th, uh, Thursday at three in the afternoon, we have a mid Willamette Valley Homeless Alliance Board of Directors meeting, and that's a virtual meeting. On Friday, April 15th at noon, there's a Marion County District Attorney debate, that's a virtual uh, meeting. 
On Saturday, April 16th at 6 in the evening, there's the Salem Chamber of Commerce First Citizen Awards Banquet located at the Salem Convention Center. That's 200 Commercial Street Southeast in Salem. Tuesday, April 19th at 9.30 in the morning, we have management update located in the Commissioner's Boardroom. That's the fifth floor of this building, 555 Court Street Northeast in Salem. Then on Tuesday at 1.30 in uh, the afternoon, that's April 19th, we have a Willamette National Forest Update Work Session located in the Commissioner's Boardroom on the fifth floor of this building. Tuesday, April 19th at 3 in the afternoon, we have a Health and Human Services Groundbreaking Ceremony for the new Health Building. That's located at 3180 Center Street Northeast in Salem. And then on Wednesday, April 20th at 9 in the morning, we have Board Session located in the Center Hearing Room. That's this room. That's the first floor of 555 Court Street Northeast in Salem. Wednesday, April 20th at 11 in the morning, we have a work session. That's a public works presentation located in the commissioner's boardroom, fifth floor of this building. And then on Wednesday, April 20th at noon, there's a rails to trails tour in the Santiam Canyon. Perfect. Got a lot going on. Anything you want to add on the record before I adjourn? No. Okay, this is probably the longest meeting we've had since I've been the chair. This was a real meeting. Yeah, with that meeting adjourned. <laughs> have a great day.